My name is Kenneth Maines. I am the president and founder of the American Investigative Society of Cold Cases, and I'm a detective. I've been a police officer since uh, 2003. Um, in that time frame, between then and now, I've uh, worked with the FBI as a member of their uh, task force. Um, I've worked undercover narcotics for three or four years and I've worked cool cases now um, for the district attorney's office for about five years. Uh, number one is that I like to help people, uh, the correct people, the people that need help. And those types of people are victims' families and true victims. Uh, I've always been intrigued with uh, mystery, whether it was the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, all the way to Amelia Earhart, Jimmy Hoffa, D.B. Cooper. Um, I've always been intrigued by that. And my friend Joe Kendall once told me that a good detective, all he needs is a little bit of determination and uh, a natural curiosity. And I have that. When I investigated my first cold case in 2007, it was a missing persons case of uh, Dawn Miller. She was 23 years old. She disappeared and I had worked at the police department for five years and I never knew that we had a missing person. And so one night I was sitting at home by myself and I looked up missing persons and she popped up. The next day I went in and asked permission to work the case. I was told no. They told me that you're, uh, you're a narcotics agent. I had long hair, I had the earrings in. You know, you're not, a, you're not a detective at the time. I told him I would do it on my own. I did it on my own. I got the report. It was two pages long. Um, within six months, I had the two suspects, and they had taken me to where they buried the body. The one suspect hung himself, and that was my first foray into cold cases. ASON got started off of my second cold case. It was the murder of uh, Gail Matthews, 23 years old, and her five-year-old daughter, Tamara. Um, I, I had took a $50,000 pay cut in order to investigate that homicide. I was told, no, you can't investigate. Even though I had previous success with this other one, um, they didn't want me to investigate it. And I said I'd do it on my own time, just like I had done the other, and they still didn't do it. The district attorney said, hey, I'll hire you to work on it, but you're going to take a big pay cut, because I was coming from the FBI at the time. I said, money's not important to me. It's important that this case gets solved. Started that case, and I thought it would be as easy as the first one. I quickly found out that it wasn't, and about a year into it, of working it every day, I got stuck. And it was a very horrible feeling for me, because I'd never gotten stuck, and I had nowhere to turn. And I said, you know what? There needs to be an organization that creates, that's created to work these, to help detectives when they get stuck. So I said, I'm going to get the best of the best. And I started calling people. And there were people that wanted what I wanted. And they knew what I wanted. And uh, ASOC was created. DNA has helped, uh, obviously, uh, tremendous in the backlog of the 200,000 plus cold cases in the United States right now. Um, with the advent of newer technology, the amount of DNA that you can get now, um, where it was a quarter size back in the 90s, now is down to touch DNA. Um, so as long as the police officers have preserved that evidence and it's kept, it can be retested and uh, there is no surer way for a conviction than DNA. So um, I would say 90% of law enforcement rely on DNA. The other 10% is actual going out in the street and interviewing people and doing the backgrounds and uh, victimology and stuff like that. But physical evidence, DNA, is by far the most crucial piece of evidence you can have. So how does new technologies, not necessarily just DNA, but just new technologies as they get introduced, uh, how, how does that affect a cold case and, you know, 
particular file? Well, the first thing that new technology does for a cold case is it pumps life back into that case and it also pumps life back into the investigator. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. The Gail Matthews case, it's been four or five years now that I've been working on that. I come to a conference today and I talk to somebody about the MVAC system and what it can do with clothing um, that could have DNA in it. So that case has always been on my mind, but my, it's, been, it's been steady. When someone gives you that hope that this new technology is available and it can solve a case for you, it, it just brings, it enlightens you. It brings a smile to your, your face and it gives you hope. And uh, today I got that, so it was good. Are there other technologies that have done that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> not for me, not recently. Okay. So, yeah. Especially with that case, you know, to know that you know that a victim has, has or a suspect has touched something, without a doubt, you know that they had touched that clothing. And when you have somebody tell you, we can extract more DNA from that than a regular swab has done, that will do more for, for your ego to keep going further in that case. And the first thing that I did after I had, I had talked to the people about the system was I called the, the victim's sister. And I said, hey, we have this new hope, and this is what we can do. And it makes her smile, and if it makes her smile, it makes me smile. There is, uh, first off, when you go and you start investigating a cold case, and you just start with the victimology and learning about the victim, you have to interview the family. It is the hardest thing in the entire world to sit there and talk to the mother of a child that was murdered because you're looking at them and you see them but peripherally you see the pictures of their dead child all around them because they want to keep that memory intact and she's looking at you with such desperation she's been through 25 years 20 you know seven years of despair they put their entire faith in you I mean they look at you as their their angel and they're like you can see the desperation in their eyes and in their voice or help me you're the guy that can do it and that right there is very humbling and it's very it's very it's very hard because you want to help them so much you don't want to let them down and that's what drives you at least it drives me to solve the case and when you do or you get that piece um, and you tell them and you see it kind of relax and their shoulders drop a little bit because they're not as uptight and you help them, there's not a better feeling in the world. Law enforcement in general should get involved with uh, ASOC because as a detective, on a, if you're stumped on a case, all you can ask for is to have another lead. That's all that you want that, and you'll take that, whatever lead it is. Um, so ASOC gives that department or that investigator other avenues to go down. And, that, and that's all you can ask for. We might not tell you it's this person 100%, but we'll say, hey, this is the guy you should be looking at. Or, this is the avenue you should go down. And that's why ASOC's important. If you got a detective who's had a 20-year-old case in there, and you, they come out here and are told, hey, you should submit those pair of panties to us because, yeah, they were tested in 1990 with a swab, but we can get more with that. If that guy doesn't get excited, he should retire because that is the, the best news other than solving a case that you can get with a detective. So I'm happy. <laughs>